Bruno, the number one best-selling uh, author of the Circuit series, Titanborn series, and the Buried, Buried Goddess Saga with Jamie Castle. Uh, he's making a return to the show. Uh, Rhett, hopefully we don't screw up your second appearance on the show. So thanks for coming <laughs> back and hanging out. No, it was I don't know. I don't know if we screwed yeah. up the first one or not. I can't remember. <laughs> I think it went well. Let me worry. <laughs> it went. It went okay. It went so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see. At internet. least the bar is super low now. So <laughs> <laughs> whatever we do this episode, it's gonna be like, oh, we had a better time this time. Let's the pause the show. Go back, watch the old show, and then we will right. start again. Everybody, right. Okay. <laughs> uh everybody that's hanging out in the live chat thanks for coming and hanging out with us tonight hopefully it's a, a fun-filled shenanigan show and uh there's a lot of people still going or already going buck wild in the chat so uh thank you guys for coming and hanging out with us uh red i think you came back uh in season two was the first time we had you on um and that would have been last year sometime yeah you i think it was wanna... last year do you want to kind of give us a little update about what you've had going on there in the last year? Yeah, so since then, I've actually been able to lend an agent. So I've been working with him and focusing sort of towards the audio end of things. So I've actually bought back a lot of my rights to my series, like the Titanborn series. Um, I signed a deal with Audible, and that'll be relaunched either later this year or the next or next year, depending on the narrator we get. Um, that'll be a, a four book series called the bastards of the ring series and so oh, that'll cool. be cool the uh buried goddess series which is an epic fantasy series i've wrote with uh, jamie castle that's coming out all three books month after another starting in november and that'll be narrated by luke daniels so oh. i've been working a lot with audible studios and then my big push right now has been for my circuit series which sort of saw a new life when i relaunched it as a as a box set kind of running my own marketing from the p publisher who owns it and the audiobook just came out and it seems to be doing really well it's narrated by jefferson mays who does the expand so that was pretty cool for oh, me because yeah. i mean i'm not a big audiobook listener myself but i watched the expanse <laughs> and you know having the same any, person who does that is pretty cool any connection to a great show like that is yeah. is yeah, I think it's going to and that's a lot of times. That's why I like uh, audio books is a lot of times you can get the, the book for the author, but sometimes you can get the book for the reader, too, and, and find something new that you wouldn't have listened to otherwise. I saw that yeah. the uh, the circuit has the orange stripey goodness um, when I was looking at your stuff. So today. it's, oh, a, li it's yeah. a little bit of cheating because Podium put it in the uh, short stories and anthologies. Uh, <laughs> so, <those> you, <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you get that orange flag. So it says the, number one bestseller in sci-fi <laughs> short stories and anthologies. There you go. Nice. Yeah. They're so clever. <laughs> but it seems to be doing well on audible.com. Yeah, they, they really say they, they, well said they did that, that by accident. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, very good. Cool. It's very well deserved. I've, I've recently just finished the, uh, the circuit. And uh, yeah, I like to think that anyone uh, who watches a keystroke medium takes away a little nugget of information or a little nugget uh, of something that um, they'll, they'll take forward and use to develop themselves. And uh, uh, reading or listening to the circuit would be <laughs> the one to take from this, uh, this show. And right. we're done. We can go now. <laughs> yeah, all right, show's over. Thank you. It was. It's actually my debut sci-fi series, so it's probably more experimental than I would try right now. Kind of a, as I'm trying to build my career, it has that sort of debut experimentalness <laughs> to it. But it's cool to see people finally reading it now that I've kind of successfully pushed a marketing campaign in this relaunch of it. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about the circuit. Um, it's it's uh, science fiction. It's kind of space opera ish. Do you want to kind of give us your uh, pitch, your um, thoughts on it? Kind of what insp inspired it and what it's about. I mean, the initial inspiration is really stupid, but it was me sitting and wondering how come in Star Trek nobody is ev everyone always has gravity on the ships. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. And then, and I was always like, this is always supposed to be like the more realistic version of Star Wars, like the one that follows physics and stuff. And there was that one answer and I Googled it and they were like, oh, there's something in the ship's plating that allows for gravity. I was like, oh, well, that's right. That's, that's crazy. So, 
that's where I, I invented this element that humanity discovers in the earth that it's allows everything. yeah that allows them to generate artificial gravity fields without needing to do spin or anything and so you could live in space more comfortably and it won't affect the body and the idea of the circuit is we kind of mined that material so much it destroyed the earth so then we had to live around the earth so that was the initial idea for the story and then i, I kind of just went with it and wanted based on everything i've read because i had just come from like a a marathon of reading all the 60s golden age guys because i was trying to really get back into the science fiction mindset after failing with the fantasy self-published thing when i was like 16. and <laughs> i so in wanting to do something different i kind of created a story without heroes or villains and it seems to be what the readers who love it love that about it and the ones who don't are like what did i just read like <laughs> who, who am i supposed to cheer for and i, I like mean it. I get where they're coming from because you know most most stories have that clear vil villain, clear good guy, and I think you know you, as you go through this series, you realize everyone's kind of out for their own thing, mostly out for survival, and everything's pretty gray in it. So, sort of like a Game of Thrones kind of experience, but yeah. even even in that, the villains are pretty clear cut. Right, and and I think my goal was to create a story where until book three, you really don't even know who is right and who to cheer for. And then things kind of come together in that book and hopefully it turned out successfully. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I read the first book and I really liked it. Um, Ralph, you, you just finished reading it, didn't you? Yeah. So I, I, I finished probably a couple of weeks ago and I, I, I must admit I, that, that's the massive thing I took from it was that uh, it was like Game of Thrones. You, you, you're, Sympathies seesawed throughout the um, throughout the uh, the book. You know, one uh, all throughout the trilogy. I, I read it as a book, so uh, as in sort of one continuous story. And like. most so, people uh, have. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, you know, some of the um, uh, some of the moral choices that, that you made, and some some of the more more. You, you've got one character who seems to be sort of like a clear cut hero, but then he seems a bit also to be a fallen villain as well. But um, you, you've also got the, 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 the other characters as well, but I don't really want to go into spoilers. But uh, did you have any inspirations for any of the um, uh, any of the sort of major characters that um, were in it? Because I said that they, they, they were fantastically realised, and uh, I'd just really love to sort of explore where where, where that came from or where they um, came from. So some of them are pretty out there, but I would say for Cassius Bale, who as you is like the main he's the presence in the story kind of the driving character behind everything and a lot of his his insp inspiration comes from kane from the legacy of kane series those i don't know if you played those yeah, games yeah. and for sage a lot of the inspiration was from marriage jade in like the older in the timothy's on star wars books oh yeah yeah oh yeah so, definitely you're talking about I, I kane. actually I actually own it. Um, and now you've said that, it's like bang, that is like snap back to it. I, I suddenly realized where, where you come from a guy who is probably probably got a, a an ulterior motive, which is quite noble, but maybe lost in the detail a little bit he, he, where his darkness comes from. Yeah, exactly. So those were probably the two characters that were most influenced by something and kind of everything, everyone else. I probably take from all the little things I've seen, all the shows, books, movies. You guys know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, uh, I mean, the, 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 shit, the series itself probably bears the most comparison with the Expanse. Um, uh, did Did you read the Expanse before you before you started on the circuit? Or? So, so the funny part about the Expanse is I actually didn't even know it existed when I wrote the circuit, and I. <laughs> I read I read book one, I think after I had finished Titanborn, which if you've if you've watched the Expanse, you know it's about the Belters and stuff and how they become sort of like slaves and they're deformed and stretched out because of the gravity conditions. And I wrote a very similar group in my Titanborn series called Ringers, who are live around Saturn, similar to the Belt, and they get stretched out and skinny like that. And I was like, oh shit. 
<laughs> they, they, beat, they beat me to it. So <laughs> I actually, funnily enough, even though that is the main comparison book I use for my series, I actually read it afterwards. Mm. And then I gave up on reading the book because I knew it was going to be a show. And how many awesome books become shows? So I didn't want it to be spoiled. You get to pick. You got to pick a show or the book. Yeah, yeah. I'm not the type book. of person who has. To, I don't really have time to do both, so I decided to pick. Well, I I like the Game of Thrones a lot more after they kind of got beyond where the books were because I was so into the books. Now I like the the show, but it was better once they started moving into new territory for me. So for you, yeah. No, I've heard a lot of people say the opposite too, but oh, really? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think those books will get finished though. Oh, <laughs> I don't even care. I still like it. He ain't looking that healthy, is he? No, he hasn't. I see him at, I see him at Jets games every year. And he doesn't seem all that concerned about it either. No, no he's loving his fame, and he's getting right. another show now, and he's done. Yeah, he's basically giving a finger to the fans for the most part. <laughs> One of the things with this circuit I really liked was um, that uh, the um, – uh, and again, I, 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 I'm gonna gonna sort of steer away from spoilers here because I think people should read it and, and enjoy it. So the spoiler free yeah, format. The but, history on the show is that we spoil it and then we do the spoiler warning. You yeah, right. Right. By the way, don't 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 mess and with it. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to mess with it. I'm going to mess, mess with it. Just with this one. <laughs> but um, what, what I would say is that uh, it, it's one of the more meter series that I've read now. As I say, I've read it, read it as a single book, but I appreciate that it was written as a trilogy originally. Did you did you plan it all from the outset, or did you did you plot each, or, or did you know where you were going through the story as you when you started writing it? Um, I mean, so for that book, I kind of plotted out. I don't even know if I could find it, but I had a outline sheet for the characters because you've read it. It's more than anything is kind of a character study. So I I wrote where they started, where they came from, where they were going to go, and then kind of had a broad outline of how the books were going to turn out. And that was about it. Everything else was in my head, which meant it took a really long time to write because I alternated between four characters and was pretty OCD about making sure that chapters didn't repeat. So there was a lot of information that would then have to happen for one character from another character's point of view and back and forth. And in a tight three book series, which is what I wanted, doing balancing the four characters was pretty tough. Probably it's not something I should have attempted on my first sci-fi series, but. So I've got a question about that uh, with four different POVs um, running alongside each other. Um, the way I do it now is I'll start and I'll write one group, like one POV from beginning to end, and then I'll go back and write the next POV from beginning to end, and then the third and the fourth, and then at the end I'll go back and put them all together so they're flip-flopped. Um, how did you go about writing your POVs for, for this book? Because you well, say you don't want to repeat. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious, were yours, like, were the characters always close together, or...? Um, in, well, so in the book that I'm writing now, they aren't, um, but uh, they do come together at the end. So okay. the, the thing that I've got to look at is when I, when I splice them, I have to look at uh, time, right? Cause some, yeah, yeah. Uh, be between some scenes, it's a couple days and on, on one arc and in another arc, it could be a couple hours between. So I just have to look and make sure that I'm not screwing with the timeline anyway. Um, but they do come together, and uh, that the next book after this is 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 actually going to have more of that. But it, it uh, right now they're at different places, so they don't interact. Well, no, I take that back. Two of them do. Two of them are on the same place at the same time, but they don't ever interact with each other until the end of the book, and then they both okay. kind of line up. Yeah. yeah. So that's like a the Star Warsy type of style. That's what I. I that's yeah. how, how the the fantasy books me and Jamie are working on are sort of like that, where we build to everyone coming together at the end. Sure, so what, yeah. What, what yeah. we'll do is usually write like the first 80% of the book and just run through those POVs, like you said, in a row. And then at the end, it becomes tougher. You have to blend them all together. The circuit, 
was pretty tough because the characters are constantly jumping back and forth between being with each other. And because I wanted to keep these like pretty tight books, that word count wise are actually only each like 80,000 words. But I worked so hard to have all the information just always be moving forward. Even if it was in someone else's point of view, they would fill in information that another person's point of view that made it a lot tougher to write that book. And I had to, had to write it in order in order to do that. Sure. Um, um, so, what, Oh, go ahead, Ralph. Sorry. Um, just, just on the notes of POV, one of, one of the most um, kind of like impressive things about your book is like how distinct each of the four POV voices are. So you've got Adam who, who sounds and feels his sections just feel completely different from say Cassius Bale um who has like like when, even when even when you're doing the sort of exposition section of his has a sort of like a touch of arrogance to them and i, I really yeah. really like that because it carried carried his character uh talon had a sense of humility to him um uh, and uh oh, forgive me I, i'm forgetting the um the <laughs> sage. sage sage yeah uh, and, and sage sort of a kind of sense of pragmatism to it um ha it, 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 because the, there was such a tonal shift, did you find it tricky to go between those four really distinct voices, or ha well, how did you control that? Because that was one of the best things, uh, from a craft point of view, about that, that I, as an author, got from your your books that that kind of segregation of the voice. Um, basically, by taking a really long time with each. That's what I mean. That, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, that. I probably spent like two years total writing those three books. And again, they're like pretty tight 80,000 word books that probably seem longer because I jump back and forth between the characters so much. But yeah, I mean, I just, I think it really helped developing that outline first, not of really the story, but of the characters themselves. Like they were the only thing I outlined and I would kind of keep that open and make sure I stayed true to them. Uh, that was the main way I did it. Obviously, Adam was a little bit easier because he's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, he, I get that. He was the most unique, but also yeah. probably, probably in his kind of um, in his thought processes. It was probably quite simplistic because you know you've just got to get things across. Quite yeah, I would tell people he was he was probably definitely the easiest one to write. And I think another thing that helped was kind of keeping the cast diverse. I mean, one's a robot. One one was a woman, one was a guy who's terminally ill, and one's a very, like a much older man. So they all, none of them really came from the same background, even though there are parallels. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps too. And that, that book just came out on Audible. Luke Daniels uh, narrated it. He just narrated uh, Terra Nova, the first audio book that I've ever had. And that's pretty wicked cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you did get the or orange stripey goodness on on your deal, but have have you seen a lot of uh, a lot more readers coming to you through the audiobook than than you had through the the ebook? Uh, so it's it's Jefferson Mays actually, not not Luke. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you're right, yet. you're right. Well, sorry, I, I'm not sure yet. It's only been a week. Um, I only know rankings, so I have no idea how many copies is actually sold. And, ah, gotcha. and I have to remember, like, the way Podium put this out was as a th the full trilogy, all in one volume. So it's a 30-hour book. So it's going to take a while, probably, for a lot of people to actually listen to it. You'll see yep. the ratings haven't really started coming in yet to align with how the rank seems to be doing. Yep. But I, I would imagine it'll take most people probably, like, two weeks, two or three weeks to actually listen through to the entire thing. And, I mean, I've heard from some people where they listen to book one and then they take a break, they listen to something else. Cause it is, it's like having three books and he, he, the Jefferson tells you when the books break. So there's a lot of ways I'm sure people are listening to such a long production. Everybody's got kind of their own re their own reader listening habits. You know, yeah. sometimes I go on a binge and I just go crazy with them. Other times I get like a half an hour a day. I'm listening. I tell you sometimes, uh, depending on the book, I'll I'll spend all day, twelve yeah. hours a day listening to a book. I've yeah. done that with, a, with several. Um, at, well, those books ended up being like fifty hours long, but um, <laughs> uh, 
I mean, if you get the right narrator, then yeah, I, I can't remember. I know that I've listened to the first three Expanse books, um, but now I, I can't to... remember. I don't know those because you told not... me to listen to them and they were all. Awesome. So, so Jefferson yeah. stopped, I think, at the fourth and then went back and redid it or something. I've, I keep reading about that. But the cool thing about him was he speaks with like that, that high English voice. I don't really know what to call <laughs> it, but like. Right. Like that Shakespearean sort of actor voice. And, yeah, receive receive and, pronunciation. That's yeah, okay. Hard. And I kind of I really wrote the circuit in a very melodramatic sort of Shakespearean way. So I don't know if Podium really thought about that when they picked him, or if they were just like, "Well, this is like the Expanse, so let's get the try and get the guy who does the Expanse." But I mean, I don't think they could have picked anyone more perfect to. Pull off the voice. I think the they. I think they put a lot of thought into their casting of their of their narrators. I think that's one of kind of their go to things that they think is really important. I, I listened to James Tong speak at a conference, and he he talked about how they really try to make the right narrator for the right story is one of their key concepts. So okay, maybe they did yeah. that on purpose. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. They all of a sudden they were just like, we got Jefferson Mays. And, you know, I had no narrator approval, so I was like, okay, <laughs> kind of do what you want. And I never even heard a sample until it was done, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'll trust you. I, I, mem I remember reading some uh, research when I, when I was going through the, 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 the audio book, um, Labyrinth, and uh, apparently you, you, you three kind of primary accents for, for an audio book are uh, Australian, which for some reason people uh, kind of default to as good guys. Uh, <laughs> The English, English. And they're always good. Yeah. Australians are always the good guys. We all know that. That's true. Because they're so friendly. Yeah. yeah. And drunk. Yeah, it's yeah. like yeah. British people are always villains because they can sound exactly. so. Exactly. Yes. They can, you guys can sound so sinister when you like just drop it down to a exactly. nice little. Exactly. So the, the, that, that was the second accent. Was um, they said in this research that um, that uh, English accents are apparently the villains. So guys, I'm the the villain of this this little piece. Yeah, uh, and the uh, the third one was um, American, obviously, um, which which is apparently sort of quite neutral. It can be good, can be bad, or but generally neutral. So I, I, you know, I'm quite, I, I, you know, I'm I'm a bit snowflake about this. I must admit, I'm like, why, why am I the bad guy? <laughs> <laughs> we should cast. We should cast the podcast from now on. Ralph's our, our bad guy. Yeah, you know what? All you got to do. Like, is I hate anytime. you all. All you gotta do is say James Bond, and it just shuts everybody up because he's the good guy. <laughs> he's the ultimate good guy. Oh, yeah. go. Now, at the end of every episode, Ralph's gonna have to do like an evil monologue, you know. <laughs> fulfill, fulfill you know he's trying to do the James Bond, like with the gun thing going across the screen, and then Ralph has got to turn like this and shoot real quick. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my my yeah, you know me. My trousers will fall down or something equally embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no crap! I was supposed to wear a shirt tonight. Oh, I'll have to wear it next week. That's my bad, Helen. Ellen, I, I said I was going to wear a shirt and I didn't. That's my bad. Uh, so we talked about the circuit for a while. Um, that the Titanborn series, um, which you've bought the rights back to and are and are republishing. Do you want to talk about that? Because I, I really enjoyed those books. Um, yeah. So buying the rights back was kind of spurred by me emailing Random House Hydra, who they own the first two books in the series. And, you know, book two didn't do very well and they didn't really put anything behind it. So it kind of died and they didn't want any of, of the other books in the series. So I sort of had released a book called Titan's Wrath, which was a combined version of what I imagined books three and four would be kind of an abridged version just to finish the series because I didn't think I'd ever get rights back. Most people don't. Um, and then kind of after a few, it did pretty well, but because I had no rights to the other books, I had to pitch it as a standalone, which is always hard in the market today. And it kind of died fast. And then when I got my new agent, he I asked him, like, what would it be like to ask to get rights back? And he basically said it was as simple as kind of just emailing and asking, and it's really up to them. So I tried that after they said they wouldn't exercise any audio rights. I had just signed that deal for the Buried Goddess Saga, and they and I told them, I was like, look, I know editors now at Audible Studios and Podium 
and I could probably get us an, an audio deal for this. And their response was, we're shopping audio rights on our own, which to me means they're not going to do anything. And I asked them if, if they weren't going to do that, what it would cost to get my rights back. And it came back as a pr pretty re reasonable rate. And I think it helps that it was a digital only branch. If it was already in print, they probably, I'd probably be into them more. But I had two book, book bubs on the first two books. So it was fairly earned out. And they sold me rights back for, I mean, it was under $10,000 is what I'll say, which is not too oh, wow. bad for buying two books back from Random House. Mm -hmm. and yeah. so, I, so I immediately pulled all the books. I pulled the sort of combined Titan's Wrath book off Amazon and started working on trying to get a deal for them with Audible and was able to get a deal pretty fast after the Buried Goddess Saga one because he, you know, the editor there, sort of believed in, in the series. Um, probably quadrupled what I had bought back the series for. And That's I crazy. Think, and I think oh. now, and now we'll probably be able to actually have it be successful. And I think one of the major problems was they sort of, book one came out, it did pretty well. Book two, they pitched as another standalone, like connected, but they weren't at, they, there was no series page or anything. And I was okay with it because, I mean, I didn't know be better then. Why do you think they did that? Um, well, so the way the series works is that book one is told from a first person point of view from one character on one side of this conflict. Right. And book two is told in a first person narration on the opposite side of the conflict. So there's two narrators, so they sort of both stand alone. It's like book 1A and book 1B, sort of. And so they decided to make them both stand alone. And again, I don't know that those digital only branches usually do have problems and they don't really know how to sell digitally very well compared to how, I mean, the tr traditional publishers know how to sell print. That's a very, very different thing. And right. to release a standalone book two, hoping it would pick up on momentum from book one when no one would even know they were connected was never right. going to work. So it, it died pretty fast, even though all like critically it did really well, but no one ever saw that it existed. I think, it had like 400 sales by the time I bought it, the rights back after probably like six months, which, you know, that's not, that's not a lot. And I think now being able to launch it, kind of add some of the stuff I wanted to add into book one to bridge the two books and connect them more. So you see both sides of these conflicts. And then in a book three and four, the two characters alternate their stories and they come together like me, like we were talking about with point of views coming together, only they're coming together in first person, which seems like a perfect avenue for audio to be able to get a narrator to sort of become these characters in first person. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. And, and so that's that was what I sort of sold Audible's, Audible Studios are. And right now we're looking at some pretty awesome narrators to try to do it. So. I'm excited about that series coming out, probably more than I ever was about it coming through Random House Hydra. <laughs> a strange I'll world we live in. I yeah, think I that's mean, one of, that, that's one of perhaps crazy, but <laughs> I think that's probably one of the takeaways: is don't don't assume that um, just because you got a traditional publishing deal that necessarily um, they get your work. Particularly, uh, the, 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 there's still perhaps uh, uh, you know uh, room for a little bit of individual movement there. Um, yeah. However, I've got a, like a brilliant vision in my mind of like this uh, this kind of like dual narration audio book where you I don't know book three where you've got the uh, both protagonists sort of meeting. Uh, is that would that be on the cards or um, and, so, uh, and two, so two, I, two narrators? So I think. I talked to the Audible guy about it because obviously, yeah, they're two very different characters and that could be cool. And his, what he told me, and this is you know, kind of helpful for anyone getting to audio, he basically said books with one narrator typically sell better unless they're the Audible originals that are super high produced like a TV show. Yeah. If you get one, one name known narrator is better than two like pretty well-known ones. And obviously, you know, they get expensive hourly, these guys. And any, any of the top ones he felt 
can change their voice to become whatever character enough that, mm-hmm. you know, it would feel like two different people, even if it's the same guy. So wasn't that what they did with the um, a, one of the Aliens books? I think that was like the, one of the first times that Audible managed the to... The Audible play. original? Yeah. yeah, if you're talking about yeah. the Aliens books, that was a... That was a uh, basically a audio production that was not an audio book that was written yeah. strictly for yeah, so, audible so that's actually i learned how it works now because my agent happens is like good friends with the audible originals guy and yeah. what it is is oftentimes they are like that where they're written ex- like directly for audio but it's not always this guy actually will edit it to work for audio if it's just a book like dennis e taylor if you the baba verse books yeah those aren't written for audio, but they're technically the same Audible original, like highly produced stuff. Right. Like his new book is, is killing right now. And so that's all under that guy's umbrella and he handles all of them. And he's supposed to be some sort of marketing genius. And it kind of shows because all those Audible originals absolutely kill. But they want specific stuff, even if it's not written for audio. I had submitted a book to him that the guy really liked, but he... Simply was just like, this doesn't fit the format I do. Because he, in the end, he wants to make it like if you close your eyes, you're watching a TV show, not listening to a book. Yeah, if you get the aliens, uh, there, I think there's three now that are out that are they're strictly done as audio productions. And also, they kind of mirror the um, the radio dramas that they made right. back in the the 20s or 30s or whatever it was back then. And, and Yeah, that's what they... I, I was, I listened to the first one, the Aliens Out of the Shadows. Uh, it was it was pretty decent, pretty good. Yeah, that's what they try to do, and they're all pretty different. Like the Bobaverse ones sound more just like audiobooks, I think. But they try they'll they'll like really really produce them, and there you'll see the multiple narrators. Like I think, uh, what's that that book, The Oriental Express or whatever. Sorry, the movie just oh, came uh, out. The murder oh, on the Orient. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They, yeah. Did, they did one of that where they call it dramatize, and it's sort of there's like ten narrators, and they all do one of the voices and stuff. But you really only get that through that Audible original. Yeah. I mean, it had to be really well done because that's <laughs> yeah, that, those drive me crazy. I like one narrator, or yeah. maybe two, like the the Wheel of Time and those things where you had um, just a couple, just two that switch. Every so often is okay, but I don't like it when yeah. it's. I, mean, I don't even yeah. particularly like a lot of sound effects. I mean, a lot of the Star Wars audiobooks, they'll have like ship sounds and things like that in the yeah, background. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, you get somebody who is given, because I mean, doing an audiobook as a single narrator, it, it's a performance, it's not just a reading. So you get somebody right. who can really put the right character and the right spin on each voice and all that stuff. I don't think you need all that other crap. I think it's know? more about the story. It should be more yeah. about the story anyway. Just a, a performer doing the doing the text, and I really think that's the best way to go. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But you know, as and I'm, you know, it's interesting you're telling that story. I I was excited because I realized I wasn't the only one because I thought everybody liked the multiple radio show acting thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, the the guy, my guy at Audible actually said that he they've heard more from fan, like listeners that they find it jarring when a, two narrators are doing a book, like unless it's done really well. As soon as the right. other voice comes on, they're like, "What what happened?" You get kind of lulled in kind of a weird lotus dream, you know, when you're listening yeah. to a, a, a good audio book, and you don't want to break the uh, the bubble, so to speak, I guess. And I would imagine the production time is, is greatly increased when you have more than one narrator, because at that point, you're basically putting on a play, which means you have to have rehearsals and, and yeah, shit that, like that, you know? So that's why those Audible originals, their budgets are huge, and their advances are huge. Yeah. But that they don't do a lot of them. And, you know, the guy, I mean, sometimes you get invited or you just submit something that the guy thinks is perfect for that medium, but... I am going to listen to the, the Aliens book you guys are talking about. I got I got some credits coming up, so yeah, check it out. It's an interesting book. It's a uh, it's actually also in between Alien Aliens and Alien Three. That's where it's set. Oh, really? In the timeline of Alien, if you are familiar with the movies Alien, Aliens, and Alien Three, which are the Sigourney check Weaver ones, um, Alien Three doesn't exist. That's just a dream. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, see, I'm of the minority. I love Alien 3. I like uh, that movie. I, I'd say Alien 3 has some of the best moments in the Alien yeah. series. Like, like uh, the test first to see was epic, but but then yeah. generally it was a load of tosh. J.R. Haley's asking if we can post a link to the Aliens book we're talking about. I think so. Uh, yeah. Duh. I think Scott has to do that, doesn't he? Yeah, gee, I'm oh. such a dumb. I think one of us will do it. Well, while he's doing that, I'll talk about the show sponsor for this week, and then we'll jump back right right back into the questions. So, uh, for this week, surprise, surprise, the sponsor for this week's episode is a Master surprise. of Hounds by it is? Stephen Manley. <laughs> uh, Chuck Manley. We that guy's a hack. Chuck, <laughs> Who is, Chuck is sponsoring this episode, and uh, his, his first book in the Pikmin Files, which is Master of Hounds, is a fantastic book. It's got an awesome cover, and here is the blurb. Clint Mercer is about to get a crash crash course in magic. Uh, Clint, uh, after he barely survives an attack on the hospital where he works, Clint is quickly recruited by the brilliant but often unstable wizard Arlo Dandridge. Working on behalf of the mysterious Pikmin Institute, the two men soon find themselves in a race to recover an ancient relic of deadly power. Deadly power! Before <laughs> a centuries-old warlock and his cult of militant followers can beat them to it. With the lives of an entire city on the line, failure is not an option. Master of Hounds is the first book in the Pikmin Files series, a dark urban fantasy filled with magic, monsters, secret societies, and dark conspiracies. <laughs> Get now yours now and new editing. That's right. Get <laughs> yours now and keep the hounds at bay. I like that hounds at bay. I'm going to put the link in the live chat, and also it's going to be in the show notes as well. Uh, if you love the end of the month, if you love Chuck, which we all do, go buy his book, support him, and uh, oh, I can't post it. Scott, you'll have to post it. I'll send it to you. And you can do it. <laughs> I'll look it up while while you're while you're talking and all whatnot. Uh, I I sent it to you in chat, but Ralph has the next question, so uh, ready go. Go, um, Bard of today. I say I've got the next question. Bard of today has the next question, really, um, uh, which is one: Do podium do indies, um, uh, and do they operate as uh, like ASEX as far as rights? Um, uh, I think I think. Um, Right, short answer for Bard of uh, today. Uh, yes, do they do Indies, uh, and uh, not quite in terms of ACX. Um, they operate more like a traditional publishing deal. Um, but more sort of accurately, um, do, you, do you perhaps, Rhett, want to use it an opportunity to talk about how you, how, how you sort of dived into the world of, um, of, of audio and uh, um, how, that's, um, how that looks to you? Um, yeah, so that's that's right. Podium actually, it seems based on what I've talked to them that they prefer indie authors. Only I, I actually had to work with them through my publisher for this series, Diversion Books, and they seem to just like a one point of contact thing. Otherwise, because because you know they're kind of they sell the most. They're all over Audible. They're doing really well. They sort of tell you what they want and they, there's not a lot of wiggle room with them and i mean if they put their effort behind your book they're going to make an awesome book with a great narrator but you kind of just have to put your trust in them you won't get narrator approval with them they don't give out advances they do nice royalties although i mean i haven't seen any royalties yet because it just came out but supposedly they have a nice royalties compared to tanner or audible studios so yeah, there is a risk with going with someone where you don't get narrator approval, but they do seem to pay a lot of money and push the books that they believe in. I mean, you've seen it with Jason, Anspa, and Nick's yeah, Galaxy's yeah. Edge series where they were like, we like this enough to put R.C. Bray behind it. You see it with Craig Allison stuff where, I mean, an R.C. Bray prints gold pretty much on audio. And <laughs> if they're willing to pay his rate, which is very high, you know, they're going to go all out for your book. I assume they paid a lot to get Jefferson Mays to do mine. But again, you are taking the risk that you don't really get to have any choice in the narrator. I mean, they even did my cover. They redid the cut my cover because they wanted to be in control of that too. And we had to get permission from my publisher to let them redo the cover. But 
you know, they're, they're a good effort to work with. They're very, very different than the other ones where Tanner and Audible Studios are very traditional in the offering advances and that kind of stuff. Podium is traditional in the way it deals with audio and that they're not through ACX, but they're kind of a beast of their own. I've never really worked with a publisher that's like them. And I, that's the short answer on them. I basically had a friend refer me to them. I sent them a series and they were interested and it just went from there. They also typically don't buy a series until it's already out and selling really well in eBooks. Whereas yeah. Audible and Tanner kind of want it up front. Yeah. P Pody, you can't, you can't <coughs> submit a story to Podium. That's not the way they work. No, you have to be referred to them or they have to find you. And they do, unlike the other ones who prefer to release books one at a time, Podium does, if they're shorter books, does like to bundle them because they see a lot of value in a credit for more hours. Yeah. Which, you know, it holds a, lo a lot of truth. So there's, there's different things about all these main publishers that are kind of possible to contact. And then, of course, you could go through ACX, where I would suggest just making sure you could afford and find a, a narrator who has some sort of following. You know, just don't dive in blind. Yeah, no, and I'll agree. Like, it's with Podium, because I'm with Podium with my Terra Nova series, and the two points I'd like to make is, yeah, you don't get an advance, um, but they give you some really good rates. And yeah. like you said, they, they'll, they'll push your book because they're, they're not open to everybody. It's not a, it's not a ACX thing where anybody can just hop in They're They're in to make money just like you are. Um, but they're in to make money on quality products that the, the, the other thing with the two book deal, like you said, is, um, I'm an audible subscriber. So I get one credit a month. And so same as everybody else that subscribes to audible. So with that credit, when I go to look at a book, I want to get a book that's, you know, I'll look at a book and if a book is, is eight 99 and one credit or 54 99 and one credit, I'm going to spend my, my credit on the 54 99 book because right. that's the long, that's the longer book. And exactly. I'm going to get more time listening off of that credit on the longer book. So what, what podium does is they will take, for instance, in my series, they took Terra Nova 1 and Bloodlines Book 2, put them together in a publisher's pack, so now you have a 15-hour book, whereas otherwise you would have two, let's just say, seven-and-a-half-hour books. So when somebody looks at that seven-and-a-half-hour book one, they're like, nah, I'll spend my credit on something else. But now they're seeing the 15-hour book, and they're like, yeah, I'll spend my credit on that. And then the cool thing is that brings them into the series. So when you do book three, even if book three is not 15 hours, if book three is seven or eight or nine hours, the listener is still going to go through into that next book because you've hooked them on the one and two. Right. They're yeah. invested so it's, in the it's, story it's, at that point. Right. Exactly. We have, we have several questions in the live chat um, that pertain to what you're talking about, Josh. And then most of them are involving ACX um, and audiobooks in general about royalty splits in ACX um, and whatnot. So, I mean, I, I have some experience with ACX. I don't know, Red, have you, have you ever dealt with them or know anybody who's I, I, i've used it a, a little bit but not you know not much that i would have had success with it or anything the, the problem the problem i see is that audiobooks are actually kind of hard to market in my opinion um, yeah to do it and that's where podium's huge value is is because they apparently know how to do it um with i have not heard an answer to the question i have not heard about they're not doing royalty splits i think I haven't looked at it for a little bit, but I think that's really depends on your narrator. If you find a good narrator mm. um, and most of your, your people who will do royalty splits, like I found an extremely talented, a uh, couple of narrators, but they're just getting started. Yeah. They're usually, that's they're usually slower. They don't really have a following. They have no idea how to market. It'll probably even less than most, most indie writers do or, or book publishers in general. So, if you're going to do self-produce your own audiobook, you need to really um, take the marketing seriously. Because on the on the flip side, if you can get them to sell, they do great because they're a, they're a bigger product. They cost more, and so you get more from them when you sell an yeah. audiobook. Yeah, I Not think you really need to look at smaller market. It's pretty huge right now. So oh, yeah. uh, I mean, it's, it's growing. relatively so. Yeah, and you want to be first 
you know, and that's the thing is, you know, a lot of people are going, man, I wish I would have started this ebook thing in 2010. Um, but if the audiobooks is still fairly young and new and small, and you could probably make a name for yourself and get out in front of that, because I think they're only going to grow bigger. I think audiobooks yeah, are going to grow bigger. But I think finding a narrator with at least some sort of following is really important. I mean, that's your Bad best idea. your best marketing tool is the follow button. And yeah. You could, and yeah. you could follow, follow those narrators. I mean, otherwise, the only real platform you could run ads for audiobooks through is Facebook. And I mean, I was running some ads all through last week because the circuit came out and they, they did really well. They had a lot of clicks. I have no idea if they converted into sales on, on Audible. I mean, because there's so many ways to buy them with a credit, full price. If you remember, WhisperSync, like there's so many ways and they all give you different royalties. So, Yeah. And, and I go on to, I go to, I go to Audible a couple times a month even sometimes and it'll be and i will search for books read by a certain author or a certain narrator because i yeah. like the narrator that much yeah i don't think i'm the only one who does that no well, i think that's, that's was, a big thing i think that's what I, you know you, you look at like jefferson mays or luke daniels or like michael kramer you you hear any of those words if you're an audiobook listener it might not mean anything to you if you're not an audiobook listener but if you're an audiobook listener like everybody else is uh, or all of a lot of us are you hear those names and they're like that's a good narrator i like them reading to me so i'm going to go buy the book that they, that they read it might they don't they might even not not know who you are you know they they don't know who Rhett Bruno is or they don't know who yeah. Ralph Kern is, but they'll go read your book because Jefferson Mays read it and they like the way that Jefferson Mays read The Expanse. Right. Or they'll go and they'll read Ralph's book because they like Michael Kramer reading all these other books, so they're going to read Ralph's book. And so that's that's what I would suggest to people if you're getting into the audio book market or if you have somebody like Podium or Tantor coming to you and and wanting to get your book in an audio. Um, do your best to try to get those those. I mean, bat Be high, finished. right? Like go yeah. high and get those narrated because that's going to affect your sales more than just a cheap yeah. narrator. Yeah. Be a cheap narrator may save you money, but if you get a really expensive narrator, that's going to make you money. Yeah. Yeah. Be patient. I mean, because well, otherwise, what, what, you're just wasting your time. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I can I just interject here? I'll just do a little <laughs> thumbs up. Awesome time. Um, and there are surprising benefits to that because. Um, that is how uh, Josh, Scott, um, uh, uh, Chuck, and I have become friends. It was through not through sort of our direct personal relationship. It was through the narrator. So I remember the first message I ever got from Josh was, "I like your book. Can I interview you um, uh, on KSM?" Because yep. I read your book on K uh, 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 through Michael Kramer, who is one of my favorite narrators. Yeah, uh, so. You know, these things really do matter and not just on a on a on kind of like a direct sales level on a personal level as well. So getting the right narrators is, is absolutely crucial. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to sort of like touch on as well was um, my, my feel from um, sort of um, th there are three big players in, in, in the in the audio world of which I've had dealing with two of them. Um, and I know the guys have had de dealings with three between us. Is um, so for the audience. Um, Podium give great royalty. All, all, all three of them, sorry, all three of them have great firepower in terms of attracting excellent narrators, who, which is what you want. Um, ACX, you, you know, you've got to be able to stump up the money yourself to get those narrators. But Podium will, um, you, you'll get great individual royalties. Um, uh, Audible Studios, you'll get a great advance at the beginning, uh, and then Tantor is like somewhere in between there. And you've got to kind of factor that into your own personal business plans for uh, for the part of tomorrow's sort of question there. So, um, yeah, you know, that that's my general feel on how that you know the three big the big players in uh, in audio work at the moment. Agreed. Yeah. And and Ralph, you have the most. I think you probably have the most diverse audiobook narrator experience. Am I right? Because you you had you've had haven't you had several different audiobook companies? Um, I've, I've, I've had two. I've, 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 two. I've had Tantor and Audible Studios, albeit um, um, mostly I've had Michael Kramer as a as a narrator. Uh, 
But uh, I, be, but I believe that that is matched by rats. Is it? Am I, am I right or? Um, I think by the end of this year, I'll have all three. There you oh, go. Well, there, you, there you go. But <laughs> Pan <laughs> Panthers with an anthology, so it's kind of just eight thousand words of, of my stuff. But you know, they got Greg Tremblay who does all Nick Webb stuff. He has a a good following. They got Nicole Poole. I mean, they all. You're right. They could get these narrators, and I know from experience, there's no possible way to contact Jefferson Mays. It's impossible. I have no way to do it. I I had to thank him through Podium. They are able, you know, to reach out to agents and contact them like a major production studio, and I think that's how they carry themselves, and that's why these places are able to get these level of narrators. Where unless you know them, like if you wind up becoming friends with one of these narrators, then go, yeah, go to ACX, have them do it, pay them instead and get more royalties. But I mean, these guys are in, are in high demand. And if you look at the bestseller charts and audio, it's a lot of the same names on repeat. And I'll, uh, I'll touch on uh, Bart of today's question. He says, uh, but what, uh, would that be a good strategy given what you know about, uh, he basically he's asking, how do I get a, How do I contact these? narrators um so a lot of like uh, uh, a lot of people that i know have contacts like you can't contact jefferson mays right well maybe the yeah. the regular person can't contact michael kramer i can ralph can yeah. um we have people that know a whole bunch of people and it's part of why we do this show and why we're doing a couple other things that we'll talk about here in a minute um is is growing your tribe right that's the whole reason right. behind keystroke so we know audiobook narrators if you have a book that you want to try to get into talk to us and we can set you up with a couple people we have ends with um publishers we have ends with audiobook publishers we have ends with narrators and that's you know uh one of the authors that we know when he went to publish his first book he went and contacted this audiobook narrator directly and said, I want to work with you. Now, he had to pay like eight grand to get his book read, but uh, he, he was still able to get it read and made a lot of money <laughs> because that narrator read his book. So, yes, JR, it's called, net called networking. So, uh, you're right. Um, but yeah, <laughs> look, I, I have I have one thing to say on that also, uh, which which is kind of supplementary what to what you're saying, Josh, is that I think if you're if you're starting out, I think you should be clear and focus on what you're trying to market. And I think most of us would be best served by marketing our eBooks and our regular books, is in putting our efforts into those and making those successful, that make them the best quality, the best story. Um, the most successful they can and, and then get a get a tribe around them and all your networking connections and that will serve you better than spending thousands of dollars on it on an audiobook that now you can't move so yeah, i think you, i, th I think you, you should definitely not i think the audiobook should come in due time but it, you should not put that ahead of the cart do you I, I, think I, 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 though I, I, that it's two different tribes i mean do yes. you think that that you would because I really think that a lot of people who are into audio, they're just into audio yeah. and they love their narrators. And that's yeah. why the narrators have the, have the discoverability. Right. Well, what I'm saying is what I'm saying versa. is, yeah, exactly. But what I'm saying is, is if you, if you can kind of show your chops, basically you can prove that I have an audio book or I have an ebook that I have say like JR said, he had 7,000 people bought his book and then he got approached by, by somebody you know, it's a proven quantity and you're always going to be easier to market a proven quantity that has lots of people who like it than a concept, gotcha. in my opinion. That's what you're saying. No. Agreed. Yeah, and, and like Mark said, it's not, it's not advice we want to hear, but it's, it's pretty solid. You know, you're going to get the most bang for your buck focusing on what you can do rather than what I, you want to do. I'll yeah. agree with Scott in that have that proven commodity first. I mean, that's that's what I did. I bought back everything and I focused all of my effort on relaunching the circuit. So I had that proven commodity and then I was able to sell other stuff. But even though eBooks and audiobooks might be that totally separate market and you can just use ACX if, you, if you're 
marketing wise, if you're smart, it is really tough. And a lot of these great narrators are getting scheduled full through the next year, even if they don't have a book scheduled. Podium, Audible Studios, Tander, they're blocking out time for the top narrators and they'll put a book in that time, time slot. And they're filling up and I think their prices are going up because they're making so much money for these publishers. Yeah. So focusing on creating a proven commodity first, even if it's not relevant, the publishers will see that fan base and assume it can become relevant. I think like Scott said, it's it's important to get that proven ebook commodity out there first. And and if you write a good, if you write a good book, it's just going to make the the narrator's job all that much easier. You know, I mean, I think the two really just, there's a symbiotic relationship there between the two. Yeah. The story's got to come first. You got to learn how to write a good book. We all, that's the device everybody always gives everybody. But then also, if you can, if you learn to market, because none of us start out knowing how to market. If you can now market your, your oh, I still don't know how to market. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm, yeah most people are just getting lucky. Yeah, and even the top guys don't know how to market audio. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. if you focus but if you, on the thing we all know how to market first. Yeah. So so learn you know learn on the learn on the ebooks and then maybe that'll give you some insights in how to do the audio books. Maybe you get a well, newsletter list. Because you have thousands of ebooks sold, and now you can move your audiobook better. I don't know; it's an idea. Yeah. Well, I think you, you can directly influence uh, your ebook. Um, oh, right. one, one of my feelings uh, that that that's the thing you probably have the most control over, with paperbacks arguably being the second, uh, and audio the third. Um, uh, but obviously, the more successful you are in one, it, it will drag the others up as well. I don't know. I, I would. I would absolutely love to to uh, have a chat with someone who's nailed audio uh, and knows, uh, and more importantly, knows how they've nailed audio as well. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, I do. But I, I would but say I don't that, think anyone knows how they've done it. Yeah. Yet. I would say marketing for at least indies like we're operating as marketing audio is way easier than print. There's no selling print is. Oh yeah, unless you, unless you could get in stores. I mean, yeah, that's if, that's the that's the realm of the big big houses. Yeah, yeah. and stores. and they yeah. know it. They a hundred percent know it. Yeah. and I mean, they're not really that great at selling digital books. Although I see that they're starting to make those prices cheaper. But I mean, the reason, and when talking to people in the industry, the reason those ebook prices are so high, is because when that print book comes out in mass paperback, print book is less than the ebook. Makes right. it a, it makes it a deal. It's just like whisper sync for audio. They're using one to sell the other, and, yeah. and they totally know it. So every every time you complain about the publishers doing that, unfortunately, they only push their top sellers on print. So everyone else sort of gets left behind with that same pricing right. strategy. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're coming to the end to make money. Uh, just like yeah, I'm to the stuff. point. I'm going to go yeah. hire a voodoo priestess in New Orleans and. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, that might work. That could be our next episode. How go. to use Blind to hire, Magic to influence to sales. Black how magic to hire a uh, voodoo priest <laughs> and do an evil seance. That's <laughs> next on. He's really, really going downhill. Um, uh, Rhett, uh, you have the, the Buried, Buried Goddess Saga coming out with Jamie Castle here pretty quick. And uh, I, I know that you guys are pumping out those books and kind of a monthly uh, rotation, but what what's next uh, up for you uh, in this this year? Now that you've um, got uh, kind of a going on mostly all indie now. Um, so not pumping too fast. We're actually finishing up the third book. We kind of accidentally made these a little bit too long and epic, <laughs> which <laughs> which is fine for some people. But book three is like one hundred fifty thousand words with four characters bouncing back and forth, so they're less. We can't produce them as fast, but we will be releasing the first three with audio, on audio and ebook, all within three months. So that'll be pretty cool. At the end of July, the uh, anthology that me and Chris Porto edited, Bridge Across the Stars, which was a part of the Sci-Fi Bridge program I helped run, that's coming. Yeah. To, that's coming to audio on July 24th. So that'll be pretty cool. We're kind of taking a risk with Tantor on if anthologies can be successful on audio no one really tries them and when they do it's like top 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 author anthology so it's kind of hard to know if there's a market for it from that 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I've I've been in a, you know, Nathan did uh, through the wormhole the explorations. That's in audio, and then yeah, Chris that's, Kennedy did. He's doing well. Um, a few credits more. I think he did a couple, but so I'm in a couple of anthologies audiobooks. I think they work pretty well. Okay. No, and and the funny part is, is that those are like the only ones I see on the charts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> for, there for you go. That the, niche. None of the big publishers are even trying it. You'll be I, number one in no time. Yeah. Uh, well. I mean, it'll beat my current circuit thing because you only need to sell like five copies a day to reach number one in that category. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I awesome. I you may have done yourself out of uh, like a little secret advantage there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would have kept, kept that little bad voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's it as far as releases. I don't think the Bastards of Titan series will come out this year. I'm hoping we'll be able to get them recorded this year, but the narrators are looking at I have a pretty long wait list, mm. so that that'll likely be next year. And then I just have, I have some other projects that probably won't come out. I'm kind of, I'm trying to not release book ones as soon as they're done anymore. Oh, sure. And, and, <laughs> and wait, hard. It's so wait hard. yeah, and wait until it I have really a series of ammo. Luckily, trying to simultaneously release them with Audible which is the plan I've kind of worked with them is helping me hold back a little bit because I signed a contract that says you can't release this until we're all ready. <laughs> no, <laughs> otherwise, I'd, oh, otherwise I'd fall into that trap. But. Right. Uh, they didn't so even, even have a term for it, which I never knew. Was it sim pub? You will sim pub. Sim pub. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sim -pub oh, yeah. That's yeah, all got, street drug. I, I, I got told you will sim pub this or else. Uh, I, I didn't want to go into what the or else was. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's how they can be. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see that. Uh, we can find you if we need to. <laughs> right. <laughs> we know. We know people. <laughs> Uh, well, everybody that came out and hang out in the live chat with us tonight, thank you guys for hanging out with us. It's a blast. Uh, always, always cool to see you guys there and uh, interacting with each other and also with us. And uh, without you guys, we wouldn't have a show. So thanks, you guys, for coming and hanging out with us. Tell your friends. Uh, we need more. Tell your friends. friends. Share them around. All your yeah, friends. bring your friends. Bring, bring all your friends. friends. We should have bring a friend night at the live. Bring your, <laughs> in the live everybody chat. bring a friend. It's date night at the live show. Bring a Ladies friend. night. Ladies bring your pets. drinks are free. Bring, bring you your pet yourself. squirrel. It'll be uh beavers. drinks are on the squirrel. Bring your pug. Oh, yeah, bring it. <clears throat> Ooh, bring your for, beavers. For yeah, <laughs> yep. yep. For and also, beavers. if you're friends with uh, Rick Bartlow, uh, next Monday at uh, seven fifty nine, send him a text and let him know the show's starting so he doesn't sleep through it again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> help, help a buddy out here. <laughs> I do have to say uh, one extremely important thing before you go, Josh. I know you're trying to wrap it up, and we're just yeah, you're good, up dude. Yeah, but yep, yep. I I like I like I like pugs. I think pugs are cool dogs. I never would have thought I liked pugs. <laughs> I'm talking live chat here because since I have a microphone, I can force my opinion on the internet. But, True. You know, I never thought I'd True. like pugs. My my kids made me get a pug years ago. We don't have one now, but I love pugs. I'm just saying that for the record. Well, I want you to know that I was watching that whole pug thread in the live chat, and while they were talking about how pugs shouldn't exist and everything, I wrote the outline for a short story in my head about piranha pugs. Oh, yeah. The oh, my, yeah. Pugs. My, my pug's name was piranha Zelda, and she pugs. would run down the stairs, and then cause her, and she would be going too fast, and then she would do a face stand, and she would stand on her face with little feet flipping up in the air because they're so <laughs> front heavy. I mean, it's the coolest. I've never seen a dog do anything like that. Uh, speaking of short stories and anthologies, stay tuned this week for oh, yeah. some uh, some really big uh, information and um, news, if you will, uh, concerning anthologies and KSM. Uh, watch the Facebook feed for that um, here probably in a couple days. Just throwing that out there if you wanted to know. Just throwing it out there. So and it could be prompt. Um, they didn't mean to cut off your story there, Chuck. So. They may be prompt. That's fine. So. I was just throwing uh, Josh a segue. That's yeah, right. Do it. Do it. <laughs> hey, so uh, like next week we've got uh, AK Meeks, and then after that we've got uh, Michael Kramer. So uh, everybody, come back, hang out with us. Uh, we are going to be. It's gonna. It's it's really. F we've got the next couple of months are really kind of locked down. We're gonna have uh, several more. Um, KSM roundtables that Chuck has scheduled, and hopefully we can stick Topic to his specific. schedule. Um, who knows? Maybe I'll just scrap the whole thing and just start inviting. He might. I don't, you know. 
I'm the boss. I get to do what I want. Yeah, he says it like I did it, and it matters. But he'll do whatever. Well, we, we, we get an hour, an hour every Monday of uh, just <laughs> dancing on his table in his underpants. <laughs> now that I was that, for. <laughs> uh, let's we'll do that next week. So uh, everybody, come back. We're going to talk about some reading. We're going to talk about some writing, and of course, everything in between. Scott, you've got the big red I button. button. I remember. We'll, do it. we'll Brett, see you guys a lot, next man. week. Thank, Thank you guys. Thanks, Red. Good night, everyone.